today. You provide some rain. Thank you for that. Thank you for this place and this provision for us to gather together as your children and study your word, to listen to the prompting of your spirit as we take these things in with understanding and knowledge and with commitment to be more the kind of people that you created us to be. So we pray to that end, Father, for our study today. So we thank you, and we ask that you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have, a, we have a guest with us today. Let's see, where did she go? I saw her just a minute ago, but there she is right here. Deborah Day. She's heard about you guys. And she says, I want some of that. So she is here. Good to have you with us, Deborah. And you're sitting amongst some good ones right there who will, who will take care of you. Get closer to hear you. Ringleader. Ringleader? Who said that? Bill, behave. Y'all come on in. We're waiting on you. Get you some coffee and some snaps. All righty. Philippians 15, verse 14. Now remember, you have this in your in your mind, okay? It's Romans. Romans. What I say? Philippians. Philippians. No, not Philippians. Romans. <laughs> Paul has been uh, really laying it heavy on the Roman Christians because of this little controversy they've got going on in the church between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Who's greater than thou? Who's more holy? And who does things the right way? Who does things the wrong way? And Paul has been stepping in and saying, now, 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 children. And he's been teaching some very valuable things to them. And things that are valuable for you and me as well. And we, we covered all of that. And he's come to the end of that. He's going to give us one more piece of teaching uh, before we finish up uh, uh, the whole book today. But he comes in as if to say, and you can almost read this in his language, oops, maybe I overdid it just a little bit. And he kind of backs up. He walks it back in today's language. Verse 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. You're not all the bad people that you might, you, you might have started feeling bad in the letter up to this point, people. Don't feel bad. I know you're full of goodness, number one. Number two, complete in knowledge. So the goodness covers the moral part. The complete in knowledge covers the intellectual understanding part. And he adds a third one, competent to instruct one another. You guys have been up there in Rome uh, doing church for a long time. And I know that you have studied and that you have read the scriptures and you are competent to instruct one another. So don't think I'm coming into your midst and butting my nose and sticking my nose in where it doesn't belong. I'm fully aware that you guys are competent, you're knowledgeable, and you're full of goodness. Okay? A little bit of walking back from this hard position he's been taking now for 15 chapters. Verse 15, I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again. Them is the tenets of the faith. He says, I've written, you, I've, written, I've written to you very boldly. I've talked to you straightforward. I haven't sugarcoated anything. Just to remind you of these basic tenets of the faith. We need that reminding of the basic tenets of faith, do we not? I forget. You know, I've been studying this book most of my life, as many of you have. I forget. And I need to do it over and over again. He said, I'm going to remind you of them again. Going ahead. Because of the grace God gave me to minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. So that Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, it's my understanding that in the Greek, that's all one sentence. That's a mouthful, though, isn't it? But we want to examine just for a moment here this, what he says, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. Uh, he, he speaks of that in other places. Look back at chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 13. Still in Romans now, okay? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I am the apostle to the Gentiles. So he adds himself to the group of apostles that walked with Christ who are, who are mainly at this point, apparently, the apostles to the Jews. Not 100%. But he says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make as much of my ministry and hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, that is the Jewish to envy the Gentiles, basically, that are being converted by my, by my ministry. He never forgets about his people, the Jews, and that they will come to Christ. And he says, I hope by my ministry to you Gentiles that the Jews will see what going on, what's going on with you and, and coming to Christ, and they will envy you, and they too then will come to Christ. That was one of Paul's, Paul's hopes and arguments. All right, going back to uh, chapter 15. Uh, look at, um, let's see, where are you? Yeah, look at Galatians chapter 1. So you go past 1 Corinthians, you go past 2 Corinthians, and you come to, ta-da, Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, uh, let's see, what does it say? Verses 11. Galatians 1, 11. Now, remember, we're talking about um, Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles. Galatians 1.11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. So I didn't make this up. I don't make this stuff up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, if you study through Paul's conversion experience and his Damascus experience, and his Arabian experience, mm -hmm. Jesus called him to this specific ministry apparently sometime in that early, early period of his life, early period not of his life, but of his Christian experience, called him specifically to the Gentiles. Paul does not. Yes, sir. I think it's Acts, Acts chapter 9 where... Ananias had a problem with Paul, and Jesus told him, I'll call him to minister to Gentiles yes. and Israel. Yes, but we get that from Ananias. We don't get that from Paul. We don't know, we don't know exactly where it was. Paul doesn't tell us. Uh, he said, I did not receive it from any man, da, 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 nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For well, you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. He had probably a PhD, maybe a THD as well. Uh, <clears throat> but when God, who set me apart from birth, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So from early on, and we don't know exactly when, early on, uh, Paul got this call from Jesus Christ to go not to the Jewish people. He already had 12 disciples do that. But to go to the Gentiles. He said, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to get an appointment, okay? Jerusalem was where the Holy See resided. Peter. He didn't go up and see Peter. He says, oh, okay, Peter, here I am. What do you want me to do? Nope, 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 nope. He says, my calling and my direction and my ministry direction came from Jesus Christ himself. Uh, did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. And then he goes ahead and tells about the, the rest of his experience there uh, after he had been called. 
Let's see. One more place to look at. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, let's back up to 7. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Talking about the apostles in Jerusalem. Uh, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. All right, so, so Paul perceived and understood that he had a clear calling to minister to Gentiles in particular. Yes, sir. Uh, didn't God give him like a sweet chair ministry to the Gentiles and to the uh, kings and queens of the children of Israel? Like a sweet chair ministry? Well, that may be. I've never heard it uh, or seen it that way, but yeah. He did. He ministered. Everybody could. And he did have the opportunity by being arrested. Uh, to, to proclaim the gospel to kings and queens. That's, that's definitely, that's true. But he also ministered to the Jewish people. Every time he went into a new town, first place he went was the synagogue to see if he could get some converts there before usually being thrown out on his ear, if not beaten and stoned. All right, let's move ahead then. Um, 16, to be a minister of Christ to the... Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. He saw himself as a little bit of a priest. What does a priest do? He comes between man and God. And in this, in this context here, he is being the guy who is God's conduit for the message to the Gentiles. In that sense, he, he has a priestly duty. So that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctification, we talked about that quite a bit early in Romans. Uh, growth of Christians toward the likeness of Jesus Christ. Growing in Christ to be what God had created us to be. Sanctification. Verse 17, therefore... I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. Do you glory in Christ Jesus in your service to God? I, you know, we don't, we don't think about that way very often, do we? Every act of service that you give yourself to do is an opportunity to glory. And give praise to God. From time to time. From time to time. Someone will express to me. How much they appreciate my ministry. Or certain aspects of it. And I try. I try. I, pr I promise you I try. <laughs> to always remember to say. Well, praise the Lord for that. Thank you. Praise the Lord for that. Because it's real easy to get yourself pumped up when people are congratulating you all the time and thanking you a lot. Real easy to pump yourself up. And uh, ministers have, are, are not immune to that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, da, 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 da. I will not venture, verse 18, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have done, said, and done. And he doesn't finish the sentence, but he keeps on talking. By the power of signs and miracles. Power of signs and miracles. Let's explore that just for a moment. Power, these, this, this phrase, power of signs and miracles, was, was a mark of an apostle in the New Testament. In New Testament language and New Testament teaching, it refers to the apostles 
and the works, the miraculous works and signs that God did through them. And Paul now uses that same terminology to describe what God has been doing through him. Let's look at some specific examples. Look at Acts chapter 19. Now, we're on the downhill side of Acts, so you got to turn back, right? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 19, verse uh, 11 and 12. 19, 11, and 12. Now this is Dr. Luke writing. Acts chapter 19, verse uh, 11. Dr. Luke writing about Paul. God did an extra, did extraordinary miracles through Paul. You don't normally, when you think of Paul, you think about the great missionary Paul. You don't think about the great miracle worker Paul, do you? I, at least I don't. Verse 12. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. How often do you bring that to mind when you think about Paul? Uh, we had a we had a minister here at our church when I first came. He was on the staff, and he was a funny guy, and he always had these little funny things to talk about. And one of his little jokes was his prayer cloth ministry. And he would sell prayer cloths for you to take home and uh, <laughs> and have your prayers answered because you bought this prayer cloth. Well, that didn't really happen, okay? Don't go there, it didn't really happen. But it was a little joke that he carried along with some of us. Uh, that uh, that were in a in a mindset and attitude to know he was just joking, but I re reminded that when I read this uh, about about Paul's ministry right here in Romans about these handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had touched, and they were taken out, and miracles were done through them. All right, let's see another another example of Paul's uh, signs and miracles. Uh, Acts 20. So we're not far from there, are we? Acts 20, verse 8. Now you remember this instance. There were many maps in the. There was, this is where uh, Paul was preaching one evening, and he got long winded. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. <laughs> Dr. Luke got colorful descriptive language here, doesn't he? When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground and from the third story and was picked up dead. He was dead, people. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Jesus said almost exactly the same words one time, didn't he? When he was raising someone from the dead. Verse 11, then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. That's, that's Eutychus. After talking until daylight, that's Paul, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. And this is only the beginning of Paul's signs and miracles. There are others that we won't take time to, to go through here. <clears throat> So Paul then, signs and miracles, verse 19, by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. So it wasn't Paul's power. He's quick to say that. In the same sentence, he attributes the glory and the power to the Spirit, not to himself. Going ahead. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Elicrium, Elicricum, Elicricum. I'm not sure if I said that right or not. If you take a if you take a picture here of the Mediterranean Sea area, this is the sea here, and this is Africa. Paul says all the way from Jerusalem. Hey, slide it over this way so the other people can. <laughs> I didn't set it up wide enough. 
That's good, I think. Is that good? Yeah. Sorry about that online, folks. Jerusalem, over here, all the way, 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 all the way to Elycrium. Now, we have no record in Scripture of Paul ever going to Elycrium except for these words we just read. Dr. Luke didn't write about any trip to Elycrium. But at some point, and we so we don't know if uh, if Paul said from Jerusalem to the border of I Elycrium mean, because he did go to Macedonia. We know that. How far up in Macedonia he went? If he got high enough to Elycrium or not? He he says Elycrium, all the way to Elycrium. Uh, Elycrium. I think I'm saying the word wrong. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. But this is present day Albania and Yugoslavia up in, up in there. So you get pretty far up in Europe here. And he may have gone well into this country, this area up here. The Romans controlled it. They had conquered it. But Paul says, and I just care, I just care all the way. Of course, Corinth, and Achaia, and Macedonia. Hadn't been to Rome yet. Let's see, where were we? From Jerusalem all the way around to Elicricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Paul was not interested in, in preaching the gospel in places where others had gone before him and established uh, churches. He wasn't interested in that. He felt his call was to break new ground, to plow new ground. And for the most part, that was it. Now, he did spend a lot of time going back over churches that he had established uh, all over Asia, this part, Turkey, and all over uh, Achaia and Macedonia, he kept going back to those churches and touching base with them, seeing what needed to be done, see if they needed any pastors appointed, any elders appointed, uh, uh, visiting with them, strengthening them. He said, I haven't forgotten about you. Oh, we had some good times back then, didn't we? Uh, so he was a good pastor in that sense of the word. He was a missionary, an evangelist, and in that sense of the word, he was a pastor. But he spent almost very little time going to places where other people had started a church. So that's what he says exactly right here. And he's, he's leading up to something. Uh, verse 21, rather as it is written, now this is from Isaiah 52, 15. So if you want to make a note there beside uh, these Words are in quotation. Isaiah 52, 15. Paul quotes it. said, those who were not told about him will see. Who's he talking about? Gentiles. Those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. And it's going to be through the apostle Paul where they will see and where they will understand him and others like him. But he's quoting Isaiah Verse 22, this is why. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. This church, this church in Rome has been here uh, for probably um, ever since Pentecost, which is about 20, uh, 25, 20, 25 years earlier. Don't quote me on that, but it's about that. Been there a long time. Probably established by Christians who were at Pentecost, not Christians, but Jews who were at Pentecost uh, when Peter preached and 3,000 were won to the Lord. And then uh, uh, Luke gives us a list of all the countries and places that these people that were converted were from. And some were from Rome. So they went back home and went to the synagogue that they had attended before 
And they started telling about Christ. <coughs> and converted uh, a lot of other Jews and started to convert some Gentiles uh, to Christ through their, through their message. So Paul said, um, where was it? Uh, I lost it. Oh, there it is. That is why I've often been hindered from coming to you. He said, I got all this other stuff. I got all these churches that I've established back over here. And I've been working really hard on going to places where Christ hasn't been preached before. And, and you've already had Christ preached to you, folks in Rome. <coughs> and that's why I haven't been to see you before. All right, verse 23. But, but now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. Whoa! Got a plan to go to Spain. Well, Spain is off the map over here. Pretty sure nobody's preached Christ over there. Now, there might be some Christians who have passed through, and there might be some Christians... Uh, some Christians who got converted either at Pentecost or by being exposed to some of these other Christians that their home was Spain or they went through Spain and, you know, dropped some hints about Jesus and the gospel. We don't know. But Paul says, i got to go somewhere where Christ hasn't been preached. And Spain's the place I want to go. And now that I have to think that, that I have finished preaching off to all the people in here that need to be preached to. I'm, I'm, I plan to go to Spain, so I'm going to stop and see you guys. Because I want to do it so long. That's what he's saying here. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. He, says, I, he said, you guys are not my destination. You must understand that Spain is my destination. But I'm going to come through Rome, and that would be a natural place to go through if you're just traveling from this area over here. And when I get there, uh, two things I want two things to happen. Number one, we'll have a good time together, fellowshipping. And uh, also, I, I could use a little help. I could use some help assistance. Typically that means financial support. And it would be expensive for him to sail all the way over to Spain to see these folks in Spain and take the gospel. Also assistance could mean uh, personal help. You know when, when Paul uh, was commissioned on his first and subsequent missionary journeys from Antioch they supported him financially and also they sent people out with him. Barnabas first, and then Silas, John Mark. The host church didn't send him out by himself. They sent him out with other folks. And he would hope that Rome would do the same thing. So that he could take the gospel to this unplowed ground over here in Spain. So that's what he's, that's what he's just told them. Uh, verse 25. Now, however... You know, is it okay to laugh at Paul? Is it okay to laugh at the New Testament? <laughs> Paul keeps saying, but now, uh, you know, if only, and maybe, and uh, but now, he said, but now, however, <laughs> there's something else holding me up from coming to you. I am on my way to Jerusalem in service of the saints there. 26. For Macedonia... And Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now this was important to Paul. Very important to Paul. Mm -hmm. He had approached the churches that he had founded in Achaia and in Macedonia to give money so that Paul could take it back to the church in Jerusalem, primarily Jewish people, and these were all Gentiles. And what was one of the things that Paul was concerned about? 
friction and animosity between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And if these Gentile Christians, poor as they were, could send a good offering back to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, it would show the, the, the Jewish leadership of the apostles the effectiveness of Paul's ministry, the validness of Paul's ministry. It would also show these Jewish Christians how much they were appreciated by these Gentile Christians and help to mend some of the some of the problems. Some of the problems. You remember the deacons were appointed at the church in Jerusalem because of the problems between the Jewish widows and the Gentile widows in the distribution of the daily groceries. So this is really important, Paul. He was he was big on unity between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And we saw a lot of that as we read through studied Romans. So this is what he's doing. All right, verse 26 again. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owed it to them. They were pleased to do it because they were, they were doing God's work. But how did, how did these Christians in Achaia and Macedonia owe it to the Christians in Jerusalem to send a gift to them? In Paul's mind. Where did the gospel come from? <clears throat> it came from the Gentile Old Testament, the Gentile patriarchs, the Gentile Christ. No, it came from Jewish patriarchs and a Jewish scripture and a Jewish Christ and a promise to the Jewish nation which fell on, fell over onto, and spilled over onto the rest of the world. Here's the rest of the world. So, in that sense, in a spiritual sense, the rest of the world owes the Jewish Christians because the Jewish Christians had the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets. The scriptures. So in mind, in, in Paul's mind, they owed them, but they were happy to do it. Um, verse 27 again, they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles had shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, which they did, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings, which they were going to do. Verse 28, so after I have completed this task, and have made sure that they have received this fruit, talking about the offering, the money, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Paul is fully convinced that he is operating and moving at the behest of, of his Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as he continues to do that, the blessing of Christ will fall on him. <coughs> it wasn't Paul's initiative. It wasn't Paul's plan. It was the initiative of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, their plan. All right, let's go ahead. Now, I have written in my Bible just for me, a little bit of humor here. After the period at the end of verse 29, but, dot, 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 verse 30, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. <clears throat> Paul says, listen, I've laid out my plan for you. I'm going to come and see you. That's what I want to do. That's what I plan to do. He said, but I, you know, in Christ, 
and in the spirit and, and, and all that has to do with Christ and the spirit and me following in, in them and, and, and being in obedience to them and being blessed by them. Listen, I need for you guys to pray for me. I, I, I'm struggling. I am struggling with this. He was here in Corinth writing, writing uh, the letter to him. He said, I'm struggling with a trip back to Jerusalem. Was he tired of traveling? No. Well, maybe. Let's see what he's going to say. Verse 31. Pray that I will be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. So he's got several prayer requests. Strung together in one sentence there, doesn't it? Number one, that I'll be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. <clears throat> there were people in Jerusalem that wanted him dead. They wanted to get their hands on this guy, this traitor. This traitor to Judaism. This supporter of this false Messiah, Jesus. This guy who was out turning the world upside down for Jesus Christ, going into every synagogue and trying to persuade them to become Christians, going to the Gentiles and persuading them to become Christians and having a wonderful response. That just drove the Jews back in Jerusalem crazy. They couldn't stand it. Satan had filled them with hate for Paul. Filled them with hate for Paul. And he was afraid. So number one, pray that I may be rescued. And number two, that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. It's one thing for these Gentiles in Achaia and Macedonia to generously, out of their poverty, Paul uses those words, out of their poverty, make a generous offering to somebody they never knew and never would know. Back here in Jerusalem. It's something else for these folks back in Jerusalem to accept it as coming from the Lord. And think with favor on these guys back here that they never would know and never did know and who were not of the Jewish faith. So that was his second prayer request. Third prayer request <clears throat> so that by God's will I may come to you and with joy and together with you be refreshed. Paul wanted to be joyous in the presence of the Christians at Rome and after this arduous journey to Jerusalem and back he would be refreshed before he took on the trip to Spain. A lot of things for them to pray for. <clears throat> Verse 33, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now by this time, by this time, Paul is likely in his 50s. Likely in his 50s. He could be late 40s. He could be as old as 60. <clears throat> However, the, exactly the old he was, those were not easy miles on his body and on his psyche. They were tough miles. He had been shipwrecked, I think he says, three times. He had been stoned. He had been beaten with rod, rods. He had been thrown into jail. <clears throat> he had been meet, uh, beaten even more times that we don't have a record of that he testified to. And uh, he had been hungry. And he had been thirsty. And he had been cold. Uh, and he had been sick. And uh, the poor boy was worn out, probably. But he was still going. Still going. And he was looking for easier times if God would grant them to him. And that's what he asked the Romans to pray for. All right, we're going to go ahead and finish up the last chapter here. Verse 16. Now, when you look at our chapter 16 in Romans, <clears throat> I think about the begats. The begats in the Old Testament. 
You know what I think of when I look at the begats? Oh, I know this is on my I know this is on my list to read through the Bible this year. I gotta read all these begats. Man, I don't want to read these begats. And the temptation is very strong to skip over those begats, and nobody knows except you and the Lord. I mean, yeah, I read through the Bible three times in the last three years. I didn't read the begats though. Because they're just not very interesting, are they? They're kind of boring. And when you look at all these greetings that Paul's going to lay out in front of us here, the first thought is, like a bunch of begats. What am I going to get out of that? Well, let's see what we can get out of this. Uh, and you you'll, uh, may change your mind. Uh, Paul typically sent greetings to the church or people that he was writing his letters to. And he also sent greetings from those who were with him. They weren't just personal greetings from Paul to these people. They sent greetings from the, the, the team that happened to be with him at that point in his ministry. And he does the same thing here. We have a list of people that he's writing to at Rome that he sends greetings to. And he has a list uh, at the end of the book of people that are with him that send their greetings along as well. And uh, I think I think the people that he writes to and the people that write with him uh, is instructive for us. Let's see what we've got here. Chapter 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Chincrea. Now, Chincrea is just, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump from Corinth. Corinth was kind of the main city, about... I want to say seven miles from this little isthmus. See, this is water here, and that's water there, and there's a little land land bridge. And ships would come in either from this side or this side over here, and they would go to here, and there's a little town there called Chinchria or whatever it is. And that's where Paul was staying with this woman by the name of uh, Phoebe. And ships would come in here. It's a pretty busy place. The ships would come in here and they'd unload their cargo and they would haul them on wagons over to the other side and they'd load them back on another boat. Because it's a whole lot easier than confronting jaws every day. So, and it, same thing going the other way. So it was a really hustle bustle place. But he's, he, he, he commends to the church in Roman his sister. Our sister, he used the word our fellow Christian to the uh, uh, servant of the church in Chin, Chin, uh, Chin Korea, whatever it is. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, be nice to her, and to give her any help she may need from you. Help with housing, help with, you know, groceries or, or whatever or maybe even help with passage back to uh, her home here. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Evidently, this woman, Phoebe, was a real uh, helper. A real helper for the church in the Corinth area. And Paul was entrusting the letter, this 16-chapter masterpiece of theology. He was entrusting the only copy, I presume the only copy, to this lady by the name of Phoebe. She was trustworthy. She knew her way around. He wasn't going to send a letter this valuable and greetings this important uh, <clears throat> with a 14-year-old uh, uh, middle schooler. This, this woman would have been somebody who, who, was, who, who could do you right uh, as far as taking care of you and taking care of herself. So Paul, very first of all, introduces her to the church at Romans and she brings this letter from Paul to the Romans and the fact that Paul spoke so highly of her here in this greeting 
would indicate that she was one to be trusted. Paul was trusting her. The church of Corinth was trusting her. You guys up in Rome, you can trust her too. She's made of good stuff. Verse 2. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Ever hear them before? Yeah. Let's see what he says. Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, they risked their lives for me. Now, we do not have, we, other than this phrase right here, we do not know what Paul is talking about. There's some incident or incidents, plural, that happened where this couple, this married couple, Priscilla and Aquila, risked their lives for Paul and perhaps for other Christians as well. So Paul is indebted to them. And it is right that he should put them up near the top of the green. Now remember Priscilla and Aquila were Jewish Christians in the church at Rome when Claudius became emperor and uh, the Jewish Christians and the Jewish Jews were making such a fuss in Rome that they were disturbing the peace and Claudius decreed that all Jews were to leave Rome. Priscilla and Aquila being Jews, irregardless of the fact they were Christians, had to leave Rome. So Paul met up with them in Corinth, first time he met him, on one of his missionary journeys. I think it was the second missionary, but don't hold me to that. The second missionary journey, but don't hold me to that. I think it was the second one. And they were tent makers. And Paul was a tent maker. So he helped them out, and they helped him out to, to earn a few coins and to work on uh, evangelizing the people at Corinth. Then uh, later, they jumped across from Corinth over to Ephesus. Okay. And uh, they were also very uh, influential in bringing Apollos fully into the uh, uh, full knowledge of the gospel. Apollos knew about the gospel, but he did not know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he became uh, fully informed then and was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now this is important because Apollos became an, a powerful uh, leader in the church and evangelist. He had extraordinary uh, <clears throat> oratorical skills. He could preach. He could really preach. And uh, so they were influential then in expanding the work that way. All right. All the churches of the Gentiles were grateful to them because they helped save Paul's life. So anybody who knew Paul owed a debt to Aquila and Priscilla. Let's go ahead. Um, tell you what, look at Acts. Yeah, look at Acts uh, 18. Just real quick. To give you a place to hang, hang your hat with Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, if I can get there. Acts 18. Uh, verse 2. 18, 2. I tell you what, 2, 18, 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were. He stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. All right, so that's the scripture reference for what I've already told you. Now the year here that Romans was written uh, was 55 AD. 
Claudius expelled the Jews in 49 AD, six years earlier. So by the time, oh, excuse me, Romans was written in 57 AD. Sorry, 57 AD. In 55 AD, Claudius, another guy came in and said, okay, you Jews, come on, come on back. Come on back into Rome, bring your money with you. So uh, Priscilla and Aquila then had left Ephesus and gone back to Rome by the time Paul wrote the letter of Romans. That's the reason he's giving greetings to Priscilla and Aquila in Rome rather than Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. You got that? Kicked out in 49, allowed to come back in 55, Romans written in 57. All right, moving ahead. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Whose house? Priscilla and Aquila's house. So you knew they were doing well financially because they had a house big enough for a bunch of people to meet in. Look uh, at 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Now this is in Corinth. This is not in Rome. 1619. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. Now, writing to Corinth from Ephesus. So remember, Aquila and Priscilla moved from Corinth to Ephesus before going back to Rome. So at this point, Paul is writing here, 1 Corinthians, they had a house church in their home in Ephesus. So this was a habit of them to have church be at their house. Again, they were well enough off to have a church big enough to do that. So they were, they were not just uh, in name only Christians. They were 100% they were totally involved in their Christian walk. Let's go ahead. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if he was at Pentecost and he was from Asia and he went back to Asia as a Christian or if he was on part of Paul's first missionary journey, which was in this part of Asia right here. And he was one of the converts on that first missionary journey. Just not explained. But this guy that Paul knew, I think the problem, this is the case, was now over here in Rome. Rome was a big hub. All those folks on the wheel went to Rome. My dear friend, calls him dear friend. You, you know, you didn't do that lightly. Who was the first convert to Christ in prophecy. Number six, Greek Mary, who worked very hard for you. We don't know anything more about that or her. But she was important enough in the church at Rome for the people in Corinth to know about. And for the reports about this woman who worked very hard for the church over here to get back to the Christians in Corinth or to get to Paul somehow. Paul knew about it or he wouldn't have written uh, continuing in verse 6, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives, who have been in prison with me. Now, Paul using the phrase my relatives, he used it a couple times in this passage, doesn't mean they're blood relatives of him, okay? They meant that they were fellow Jews. That's what it meant. Uh, my dear friend, who was the first con uh, Greek Mary, uh, Greek Andronicus and Junius, now, Junius was a female name. And speculation by scholars is that since they're mentioned together in the same sentence, that Andronicus and Junius were married. <clears throat> My fellow Jews, let's, write, let's read it that way, who had been in prison with me. There's no record otherwise in the book of Acts about these two being in prison with Paul. Luke did not write everything down that happened to Paul. They're just 
There are just some things he couldn't couldn't write. Too much going on. Not enough pen and paper. But these two had suffered for the faith alongside Paul, being in prison with him. And Paul didn't forget that. He wanted to make sure that these two folks that suffered along with him got their greetings from him. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Two things here. Outstanding among the apostles. The word apostle can mean messenger or missionary or evangelist. Messenger of the gospel. This would not be one of the twelve apostles who walked with Christ. Or, that's, that's one meaning. The other meaning could be that among the apostles they were outstanding. Probably the first meaning is, is the most correct because it's, uh, you know, it could be that they knew the apostles if they visited in Jerusalem and were involved in work in Jerusalem alongside the apostles. But more likely, they were outstanding in their zeal for missionary work and evangelistic work uh, in bringing folks to Christ. And Paul says they were in Christ before I was. He said, I've been a, I've been a Christian a long time, but these these two, this couple has been has been a, has been Christians longer than me. Give them greetings. So he wanted to greet them. Greet and am, am, uh, verse eight. Greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. All three of these verses refer to uh, slaves. Perhaps freed slaves. But these are slave names, according to the scholars uh, that I referred to. Slave names. And, and they uh, uh, were special. They did some special work with the church at Rome. Paul knew about it somehow and sent greetings to them. Uh, moving ahead, uh, last half of verse 10. Greet those who belong to the house of Aristobulus. All right, there's some speculation here, but it's not unfounded speculation. Aristobulus was the brother, or was the grandson of Herod the king. He was the brother of uh, Herod Antipas. And Aristobulus, if he's talking about the same guy, that would have meant that he knew uh, the power structure in Rome. He was known by the power structure in Rome and was involved in the power structure in Rome because his whole family was in Roman politics because uh, Herod Antipas was a political appointment by Rome. Herod Amp Antipas took his father's place in ruling Judea. See the connection there? And he says, those who belong to the household of Aristobulus, doesn't mean that Aristobulus cared a thing about Christ, but the people, servants, the servants in his household, the slaves in his household, were largely Christian. Taking this statement right here. Uh, Greet Herodian, my relative, that means a fellow Jew. We don't know anything about him other than that or uh, other than uh, the folks that uh, somehow Paul knew about him. And he was worth, worth and worthy of greeting. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who were in the Lord. Now, i got to read you a note here uh, to explain Narcissus. His full name, do, 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 that's not it. Here it is. It says, perhaps... A reference to being a, uh, uh, no, 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 not that. Sometimes, this Narcissus, sometimes identified with Tiberius Claudius Narcissus, a wealthy freedman of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. So if, if that's the same person, and it could be because it refers to his household, <laughs> meaning he was wealthy enough to have a bunch of slaves working for him. Doesn't mean that Narcissus was a Christian, but he had some slaves and servants who had become Christians. And so he says, 
greet, greet the folks that are in Narcissus' household. And this may be uh, the same Narcissus who was a free man who uh, was closely associated with the Emperor Tiberius. Go ahead, verse uh, 12. Greet uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa, whose women, those women who worked hard in the Lord. Uh, you'll see several references. If you, if you add them all up, there are about four or five women. Uh, and Paul has nothing more to say about them except they worked hard in the Lord. Or worked hard. Worked hard. Hard workers in the church. Women. He appreciated that. And they deserved to be recognized and greeted. Greet my dear friend Persis. Another woman who has worked very hard for the Lord. Now here comes an interesting one. Greet Rufus chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me, too. Or a mother for me, too. So you got this guy named Rufus, and you got this his mother, and his mother treated Paul like a son. Somewhere at some time. Now, here's the speculation. Um, if, you, if you look at Mark 15, look at Mark 15 real quick. Mark 15, verse 21. You're familiar with this. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. This is the only place where this story is mentioned. Written by who? Mark. Who is Mark? Mark was John Mark. Who is John Mark? Where is he from? He was from Jerusalem. His mama, what happened at John Mark's mother's house in Jerusalem? The Christians met there, number one. The apostles met there whenever they were in town. Jesus met there when he was in town. And after... Uh, Jesus was crucified and Peter uh, was in jail and perhaps headed for losing his head and the angel came and freed Peter from jail they were having a prayer meeting at John Mark's mother's house so this was a central uh, group of folks in Jerusalem Christians devoted to the Lord and John Mark was a part of it now where did John Mark get his information from? Peter. John Mark was a close associate of Peter. John Mark was not an apostle. He was a young man. He was a very young man when, when, when Christ was alive. But he took up with, with Peter and followed Peter and Peter's long trek from Jerusalem to Rome. We don't know how long that took. We don't know how all the stops were along the way. We're not giving that information. It's not important. But it's, it's, it's fairly certain that John Mark was in Rome when Peter was in Rome. We don't know how long Peter was there for. We know he, was, he died. We know he died in Rome at some point. We're not even exactly sure of his death. But John Mark was an associate of Peter, and he wrote, he got the information for his gospel, the gospel of Mark, from association with Peter, and Peter's preaching, Peter's stories. So, you got then John Mark in Rome at some time, at some point. It could be that the story about Simon of Cyrene and his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, were told by John Mark to the Romans, and Rufus just happened to be in town. He may have moved or not. That is some level of speculation, okay? But it's interesting. If you take all those pieces and put them together, that Rufus could have been the same Rufus whose daddy carried the cross for Jesus on that day. All right, moving along. 
Verse 14 and 15. I'm going to read them together. Greet all these guys. All these guys are freed slaves. According to the Greek rendering of their names. Freed slaves. Then in verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. It says, when you go see the Christian, give them a hug and give them a handshake. All right? That's in today's vernacular. When you go to visit the other churches, you know, hug them as a brother, <coughs> hug them as a sister, shake their hands, give them a greeting. That's what he was telling. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Let's move ahead and finish this up. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. That's important. Keep away from them. Those who are divisive cause divisions. Paul hated divisions in the church. And it was usually then and now caused by these same kinds of people. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Watch out for these people. Cling to the good. Be discerning. These people that bring in divisive ideas and divisive behavior, don't let them divide you. Stay away from them. Have nothing to do with them. And I need to take you to, uh, very quickly, to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Paul wrote this letter to Titus to give him instructions about how to handle uh, the church that he, Paul had put him over in charge of. Titus chapter 3. We'll start with verse 9 because it's, it's kind of related. Titus 3, 9. It's right after 2 Timothy. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. And I go back to what Pastor Rob uh, said the first time he sat in this room right over there. And he was answering questions and he said, listen, there are important things that we can agree on. And they're important for the faith and they're important for the health of the church. There are a bunch of other things we're never going to agree on and they're not worth two cents arguing over. That's what Paul says here. Verse 10. Warn those who are divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, had nothing to do with it. That's an awful lot like what he says to the Romans here uh, when he says, uh, da, 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 keep away from them. Keep away from divisive people. You warn them, you can even warn them a second time. But if they get to a place where they need a third warning, just have nothing to do with them. Do not let divisive people have their way in church. One of the first Baptist churches, this church's problems in the past have been letting divisive people have their way in the church. Because the pastor wanted to keep everybody happy, or because he was afraid that he might upset somebody, because so and so was liked by somebody that had a Sunday school class, or they were a deacon, or they did this and they did that for the church, or they gave a lot of money. We gotta be we gotta be smarter than that, people. We've gotta be smarter. We've got to obey the dictates of Paul. Don't let divisive people have their way in your church. And we've done that too often in the past. I could sit down right here and tell you about a bunch of people and you say, what? Him? Her? Yep. Yep. Paul says, stay away from it. Now, real quick. The grace of our Lord be, uh, Jesus Christ be with you. 21, Timothy, my fellow co-worker. He picked up Timothy way over here on his second missionary journey. He had become a Christian. Paul circumcised the guy. He was a Gentile. His father was a Gentile. His mother was Jewish. 
And Timothy agreed to be circumcised so that he could go with Paul on his missionary journey and approach Jews about following Christ and him not have the stigma of not being circumcised in front of those Jews. Okay? Brave young man. My fellow worker sends his greetings to you as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my relatives. Uh, again, fellow Jews. Now, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a couple of uh, scripture references here. We don't have time to go to them. Jason, Acts 17, 5 through 9. Acts 17, 5 through 9. Turns out he was probably a high up city official, heavy responsibility of taking care of the roads and the sewers and public buildings and things like that. There's some room for doubt, but it, it pretty pretty uh, significant. And also, Sosipater, you can see another reference to him, uh, Acts 24. Acts 20, verse 4. And then Tertius, who wrote down this letter, you know, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Very big of, of Paul, after this guy Tertius, or Tertius, uh, had labored for probably quite some time to take down Paul's dictation to the Romans. It was big of Paul to allow this guy in first person to give his own greeting. That, that honored the treasured scribe that Paul was using for this letter. Uh, Gaius, whose hospitality, verse 23, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. I'm going to give you some scripture references about Gaius too. Acts 18, 7. 1 Corinthians 1, 14. Now, in one of those passages, you will find his name to be Tertius Justice. Well, actually, Gaius Tertius Justice was his full name. And in this particular place and one other place, he's called Gaius. And another place, he's called Tertius Justice. But it's the same guy. But evidently, this church met in his house in Corinth. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works. Oh, that's the guy. Excuse me, I got him mixed up with Gaius. Or got him. Well, I've forgotten what I told you. <laughs> but Erastus is the guy who was the city director of public works and took care of roads and buildings and public buildings and sewers and drinking fountains and that kind of stuff. And our brother Quartus, we don't know anything else about Quartus, senior greetings. And he gives this great final doxology. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. That's all one sentence. Dash. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. One thing and then we'll quit. Ephesians chapter 3, he gives us this mystery. What is the mystery? Ephesians chapter 3. After 2 Corinthians, you've got uh, Galatians. And after Galatians, you've got Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, actually... Yeah, that's one. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. But the, the, the points 1, 2, 3 is 1 Corinthians. Sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This mystery that Paul keeps talking about. Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. No, that's not it either. Ah! I hate it when I do stuff like this. Let me look at Ephesians again. Ephesians 3. Oh yeah, here it is. It's in Ephesians. He does talk about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. This mystery, here it is, he defines it. This mystery is that through the gospel, number one, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. That's the mystery that has been withheld from humanity ever since there was none about God. 
Number two, members together of one body. Israel and Gentiles in Christ are together in one body. And number three, sharers together in the promise in Jesus Christ. That's the mystery. And the mystery has to do that Gentiles are just as deserving of receiving the gospel as the Jews are. And when they receive the gospel, they stand on the same ground as the Jewish Christians do. That's the mystery revealed in these times that Paul was living in by Paul. Nobody else was doing that. Nobody else was doing that. Paul was. All right. Thank you for staying. Next week, we go to uh, Hebrews. Hebrews. And uh, we'll learn a little bit more about Apollos next week. Since a lot of people think that he may have been the author of Hebrews. And we'll learn some more about Barnabas. Since some other people think he may have been the author of Hebrews. But it's an unsigned book. Bye. <laughs>